I Wanna Jump Like Dee Dee with me, Jar Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. Okay, so today we're in South London and with a guitarist, producer, composer, author and activist. Now musically, he's worked with artists like Faithless, Sinead O'Connor, Dido, Emiliana, Torini and Roland Gift and contributed to the amazing One Giant Leap project which featured musicians from all over the world um, and included luminaries such as Nina Chair and Michael Stipe. Now, his current collective is called Slovo with singer Barbarella and their latest album is called Bread and Butterflies. And this one really kind of expands on sort of previous collaborations with um, one of my sort of favorites, which is the hip hop innovator, Mike Ladd. And, and I've got to say, like, Barbara is a truly kind of remarkable vocalist. Um, for me, so it really sort of switches between Gwen Stefani, like, vocals on, uh, on one of the songs, and um, kind of power, a very powerful soaring opera. You can't really sort of put a genre on Slovo, and that really kind of works for me. I think that's a good thing. I think we spend far too much of our lives sort of putting, putting things in boxes and compartmentalising. So, you know, when it, when it defies genres, I think that's a good thing. So welcome to Dave Randall. And Dave, thanks very much for, for coming on. Pleasure to see you. Charles, it's great to see you again. Yeah. So if I could just read something from um, your song, State of Mind, uh, which is actually the poem that Mike Ladd read, um, which I think sort of sets the tone for what is, comes across as very prevalent in, in both your music and, and your writing. And the poem goes, one of the verses goes, the law demands that we atone when we take things we do not own, but leaves the lords and ladies fine who take things that are yours and mine. And I thought that was an amazing um, sort of sequence to put into that, into that song. Um, as I say, something like, kind of like social justice is something that's really sort of prevalent. I'm interested in your you know, kind of formative influences, you know, where, where your mindset sort of originated, you know? Um, well, yeah, that, it's nice that you noticed that poem. And by the way, thank you for the very generous introduction. Um, the poem is actually a slightly adapted version of, a, um, of, a, of an old folk poem that people might recognise. The first mm. verse is um, the the goose on the common you know yeah um, i can't remember the quote exactly but it's 17th century english i think yeah uh, or in, i think it's english although i'm not 100 percent sure um so it predates it predates karl marx and the utopian socialists and the labor movement and all those sorts of things um and i um but i was interested in the wake of the election at the end of 2019 which was that, you know, big majority for quite a right wing conservative party here in the UK. Um, I wanted to, yeah, to include some references to this long tradition of struggle um, mm. on behalf of ordinary people, struggle by ordinary people for a better world. Yeah. And um, really to remind people that this theme um, that we, you know, that we ordinary people have been stolen from, um, mm. continue to be stolen from in a number of different ways. I, I think that that's a theme that we need to remember, you know, um, I, I, because we're living in times where it's where it's easy for people to have the wall pulled over their eyes. Yeah. You know, it's easily it's easy to become distracted. It's easy to um, to consume falsehoods on social media. It's easy mm. to kind of lose your way i think yeah. and, um and yeah that poem for me is one of a number of attempts on across that album and indeed across all three slovo albums yeah um it was part of an attempt to to open up a conversation mm. about social justice yeah. and about politics and economics um now i know that you know politics and economics and social justice i know that this all sounds rather worthy when when what we're fundamentally talking about is 
a pop record. I mean, yes, musically eclectic, but, you know, uh, unapologetically poppy at times. Mm. Um, but, but I've always felt, personally, I've always felt that, um, well, two things, I suppose. First of all, I've always wanted to try to be honest about what I'm thinking and feeling. You know, I've always tried yeah. to do something. I hesitate to use the word authentic because it sounds a bit cliche. Jade. but you know i've always tried to really be be honest about um what matters to me and i've always tried to create music that i feel that is heartfelt for me yeah um and for me th therefore that means that means including not talking exclusively about politics but including uh politics in 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 my work um quite often i mean certainly in the slovo project that's um you know, the politics is a theme that crops up time and time again. Yeah. So you asked me what my influences were. I mean, you know, I've, I've been a bit of a lefty, uh, a bit of a political <laughs> activist for, um, I, you know, for quite a while, for more than two decades, really. And um, so, you know, you know, there's the whole bunch of musicians who um, inspire me in, term, in terms of bringing politics and, and, and music together. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Dammers springs to mind. Jerry Dammers, yeah. of course, the special AKA mm. and uh, specials. Special AKA was the uh, the name he gave to the outfit who recorded Nelson Mandela, free Nelson Mandela. That was um, yeah. that was a key moment in my childhood. Mm. Jerry's a little older than me, so I was just a kid when he had hits with the specials and then the special AKA. Um, but there's a whole bunch of people. Um, in fact, I've written about this stuff. So, you know, so there are musical influences yeah. when it comes the, uh, the political content. And then there are, you know, political thinkers as well who have um, had a big impact on me mm. over the years. So, so, yeah, you've kind of, you've, it's very perceptive, Giles. You've gone straight to um, a theme which is, which is definitely a fairly central one for yeah. me for a while. It's, it's it's funny about you know where where these you know where where mindsets come from and um, I guess I've I've sometimes you know I try to work out where mine comes from you know my like when I was growing up um, you know my dad um, you know his background and I, th I think it's I think it's, I always think it's interesting to go back you know sort of generations to see where it's you, you know what follow the the trail so to speak. You know, um, my dad didn't have any any money. He he educated himself, became a mechanical engineer. You know, and um, but was always a you know kind of labour supporter, and you know instilled in me really um, not not indoctrinated, but you know he was very much about um, you know kind of equality and you know kind of justice and, and things like that, and and that that certainly sort of fed through fed through to me, and of course then the, some of the the events. You know the world events that you you grow up with as well. I think always have a have an yeah. impact. You know when you see these things happening, and it's definitely yeah, I, that's definitely true. I mean, in terms of my family background, my my, my family's not. My mum and dad are not particularly political. I mean, my dad very much stays up to date with what's going on in the world, but he's yeah. not. Um, he's not. Uh, a member of a political party or um, he's not particularly left wing. Um, I would say, broadly speaking, they're both liberals in, mm. in both senses of the world. So, you know, so, so when it comes to social issues, they're liberal, but yeah. also I think he would probably be a supporter of, um, of the economic status quo at the moment. Um, yeah. I'm not much more of a critic of mm. it, but my mum is, a Christian and I was brought up um in the church yeah and I I'm I I um I lost my religion to quote Michael Stipe who you mentioned <laughs> a moment ago, um when I was about 18 yeah so I'm no longer religious but I mention it Giles because I think that um I think that some of the conversations I heard uh through the church had a big impact on me. So there was a, a quite a left-wing kind of, um, uh, you know, vicar locally who was part of CND and part of the anti-apartheid struggle. Mm. And he kind of brought these global issues 
um, into his sermons, I suppose. And um, and I, I remember kind of chatting with him just one to one on a few occasions. And I found him interesting and influential. Um, and indeed, a couple of times I went to um, this kind of this music festival run by left wing Christians. I went there a couple of times when I was a teenager. Mm. And again, it was um, it, it was quite it was quite the politics were by and large. I mean, I'm sure there were some um, glaring kind of ex ex exceptions to this, but by and large, it was kind of left of Labour politics. It was anti-racist politics. It was internationalist politics. Mm. It was, uh, you know, it was it was almost all good stuff. And so I think that that whole experience had an impact on yeah. me, um, even though now I look at... Um, the church that my mum is still a member of. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of, well, I, I hesitate to say it, but, and, I, and I'm not including my mum herself, but I do think there are a lot of kind of old Tory hypocrites there mm. kind mm. of pay lip service to uh, these Christian values, but actually would do very little to help their brother or their sister, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, so, so I, I, you know, I don't think that the church in general is a particularly radicalizing place in Britain. Mm. Uh, but for me, I think it was to some extent. Mm. Um, well, I was going to say, I was going to say when, when, when you were when you were growing up, would you would you have said that you were a well, a couple of things. You know, would you said that you were a sort of curious kid, you know, a teenager, you know, sort of interested in finding out things, and and also, you, you know. I mean, curiosity sort of feeds your identity as well. You know, kind of like who you are as a person and who and how you how you kind of evolve. How how did that sort of work out for you when you were when you were younger? And that you know, in terms of sort of forming who Dave Randall is now. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question, and it's one that's been on my mind a bit recently because I recently became a dad myself, mm. um, and. And, 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 you know, my, my experience so far is that is that that kind of takes you back. Um, well, it makes you more conscious of how you want to try to be a dad, how you want yeah. to try to pair. Maybe, you know, maybe maybe not in completely the same way that you were parented. Um, and <laughs> and so, yeah, related to that, where do we get our sense of curiosity and identity from? I mean, I, when I look back, I'm it's a bit it's a bit sad to say it really but but i think to a large degree i identify i found i found ways of constructing my identity where um in 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 contrast to other people so rather than it being this active kind of pursuing the things that, that i was curious about it was more finding stuff that 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 um other people hadn't already become experts at and were you know it, so uh, so my older brother was considered to be the hardworking academic one. Mm. So I thought, well, that, you know, that's off the table for me. And then my best friend was was great at just about every sport, um, naturally gifted. He was also brilliant on the piano. There's part of me, Giles, I mean, sad to say it, but there's part of me that thinks that I just stuck with the first thing that that, you know, that I felt like I could shine a bit you could shine out, yeah so for me that was that was guitar um although my best friend he he still plays a part in that story because it was his older brother who actually inspired me mm. uh, his, his old brother was a was a guitar player um and there's a church connection because their dad was the vicar of the local church so that so this is all actually interlinked uh you know predictably enough um <laughs> but, so my best friend's older brother played guitar and, and I felt that that was available in terms of me hanging my identity on something God, yeah. that yeah. was available and he was very kind to me he um he you know he he helped set up my first guitar which was just a you know a 20 pounds out of the local paper it would have been unplayable without his generous kind of time spent fixing it and um and he taught me my first open chords and, and my first pentatonic scale and so on and um and um, yeah, so so I, I don't know really. I don't know the answer to your question about how much it was my 
curiosity yeah. uh, running the show or how much it was my insecurities running the show. I mean, I, I'm not sure. Mm. It's, as I say, something I've been thinking about and I haven't really reached any conclusions yet. Um, but certainly I want to make sure that as a parent, I encourage curiosity and I, and I think the best way to encourage it is, is to show an interest in yeah. your, uh, you know, whatever your kids are into to, to kind of show an active interest in that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, 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 um, I don't think I had a lot of that when I was a kid, really. I mean, I don't mm. want to sound too critical of my dad because in lots of ways they were, they were great. They were there for me. We never went hungry. Um, and, you know, lots of good things to say about them. But I don't think they were ever, ever, I don't think they have ever been actively interested in the, the things that I became interested in. You know, I don't yeah. think they could tell you the name of a song on any of my albums or, or I don't think they could tell you much about my politics. They, they'd know that I was a lefty. They'd know I was a socialist. Mm -hmm. um, but they wouldn't really know any details and they wouldn't be particularly interested to ask. But that's fair enough. That's yeah, fair enough. Yeah. No, it's an, it's an, I, I, I think, you know, I think, I think curiosity, I mean, I think curiosity is, is th th these days is sort of so important, so important for, 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 for everybody. I think that, you know, if I think back to, you know, kind of pre-internet, let's say, um, you know, when I was a, I was a teenager, you know, kind of mid, mid eighties. Yeah. And, you know, you had to go find things out. You, had to, you, you really, that, that was the only way you could, you could, you could get to know about things. You had to sort of actively kind of go, go and search. And I think, and this is not another kind of criticism of technology, but I think it's become easy to, to not be curious. You know, because you know information is is kind of readily available, and 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 it's so it's easy not not to be curious and to kind of accept things for what you what you sort of get fed. So I think that now I, th I think you, you know to you know because we are living longer, we're working longer, and you know the old sort of traditions of um, you know that that my dad had of, of working pretty much a three stage life. You know, you go to get your education, you work, and then you retire. That was it. Mm. And now it's it's like, well, we're, we're we're living longer. We're now expected to work longer, and that 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 kind of life is not kind of is not sustainable. If I just look at myself, you know, now with this, the sort of stuff that I'm doing, I wasn't doing them ten years ago. I wasn't doing them five years ago. Mm. And and it, and it, and it's it, you know, I I I just think that you know to be curious, I think is I think is hugely important to you, you know to, to live in the, in, in the in in the way that the world is and the and the sort of lives that we are leading now i guess yeah i i mean i i completely agree with that but i mean to return to the question of the internet i i think it works both ways i think mm. at its best it can actually really fuel one's I, curiosity i, agree. I, mean, yeah. I absolutely yeah. loved the fact that i can now go online and yeah guitar lesson with a fairly obscure new york based guitarist mm. who you know who back in the 80s i would have had to have saved up for a plane ticket and perhaps you know god what did we do back then written a letter to and asked whether he'd give me a lesson I, yeah now i can just hop online True. and um yep. there's hours of tuition from from so um that's the positive side is that you know if you're serious on a subject on a particular subject uh, there's so much great stuff available Agreed, but yeah there is i think also a much more insidious and problematic aspect to the internet which relates to what i was telling you about when i was a kid um because i do think that it's i think it's really important for for young people to find something that they feel good at now whether or not they're actually good at it is besides the point but but they feel like they either you know i felt like i was okay at guitar i was yeah. i was maybe the best guitarist in my class at school mm. i was probably the best guitarist in my street you mm. know mm. i wasn't the best guitarist in the school uh and I, and I certainly wasn't the best guitarist in the neighborhood but on my street in my class that felt good it felt, felt encouraging good. yeah now the problem with the internet i think for young people in particular is that you know, you, you just have to kind of turn on Instagram and you will see thousands of people who are better than you will ever be, or at least yeah. it can feel that way. 
yeah you know you 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 know you'll see a kind of um uh an eight-year-old in you know in in some far-flung corner of china who can play more technically accomplished pieces than than you feel you'll ever be able to do and and that i think can be demoralizing i think that's the that's Mm. the more pragmatic side this idea i'll never be good enough yeah or i suppose um what's spoken about more frequently this idea that that you know that i don't look right that i've got Mm. the wrong body type you know all Mm. the insecurity related to um to body image and looks and so on so so yeah i i think that must be a minefield i mean luckily you know luckily i'm i'm too old to be affected by that stuff i i'm able to engage more with the kind of the exciting side of the internet <laughs> which is, you know finding old footage of t-bone walker that i didn't know existed or whatever you know yeah um, yeah i mean i guess i, I guess the, yeah i think i think you're right you know that the, 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 the there seems to be a lot of um focus on how to how to differentiate yourself you know you, you know when you when you're looking around sort of on on instagram for example it's like okay well they're doing that they're doing that how do how do i stand out from the crowd i oh, my god i mean it's i mean i mean you're right this is where the you know you you limiting self-belief comes in you know you know it's like okay well i can't do that i'm not good enough. i'm not good enough for that i mean that's 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 quite a quite a problem it's yeah quite a challenge it is a problem. And actually, I say it doesn't affect me, but it does a bit, you know, mm. it does, even at my age, you know, when you can see um, effect pedals being demoed by 20 year olds. And it's just, you know, they're, they're yeah. just incredibly, uh, you know, the level now of musicianship is so high. It slightly makes me think, oh, perhaps I should <laughs> perhaps I should retire. Perhaps, perhaps I should hang up the guitar and <laughs> focus on something else. I mean, but but then I but then I remember why I play guitar, and it's not to compete with other people. It's because I love it, you know. Because you love it, yeah. And I'm lucky to do it. I mean, that's the other thing is it helps helps me pay the bills. So those two things, the fact that it helps pay the bills and and I love it, um, keep me going. But yeah, I I, I can see how um, how I can see how you know the internet could be very off putting. Yeah. I mean, you've been you've been like over, over your your career. Um, you know, you you you've been you know a great you know sort of collaborator. You've worked with you've worked with a lot of people. Um, o- o- over the over the time, you know, what what sort of attributes and you know kind of mindset has that has that life given you? Would you say? Um. Well, I mean, that's definitely fed my curiosity, you know, because the, the the collaborations that I've been a part of with people from different musical cultures have often mm. been satisfying. Um, so, you know, I made a, an album with a Senegalese chora player. Mm. It's, um, uh, it's quite a few years ago now, but that was an absolute joy. Um, not only to try and kind of feel my way into his music and vice versa, but also because of the stories that he told me and the things I learned about mm-hmm. West Africa um, and, 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 and indeed the relationship between music and politics in West Africa uh, to go back to the political thing. Yeah. Uh, because just to, it just so turned out that the, the dad of this Cora player who I was working with was very close to the government in Senegal that achieved independence or, or, or you know w- was installed once independence had been won back in 1960 Leopold Sen- Senghor was the mm. prime minister he was very close to my friend's dad Sudinulu Sisoko um, so you know you learn all these wonderful things when yeah. you collaborate with people. you learn all okay. this fascinating stuff and you grow both as a musician and as a human being don't you so yeah yeah I I love collaborating with different people um, and um, and I love trying to improvise with with different people. I mean, um, that's a slightly different thing, but um, but it's been on my mind recently, improvisation. And um, and indeed, that is how I first became friends with Mike Ladd, mm, because we mm. worked in a, a very unusual kind of quartet for uh for several years oh, so this is the, the the improv isn't it yeah 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 it was um a band that was based in paris mm. and it was 
fantastic German drummer, Dirk Rothbrust, um, yeah. an American clarinetist, Carol Robinson, myself and Mike Ladd, me on guitar, electric guitar with effects. And, um, you know, it was music that would have very niche appeal, but I, I just kind of, I found that, I found that very satisfying on, 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 in, in ways that, you know, playing, playing structured music um, isn't. So, mm. you know, I love playing structured music too. I love touring with Faithless and playing exactly the same thing night after night. You know, I think there's a real enjoyable discipline to that, trying to perfect yeah. it, trying to play it a tiny bit better. You know, I enjoy that too, but, but the whole kind of question of improvisation, the whole kind of philosophy behind it and the debates that rage within mm. those sorts of scenes, I actually find quite interesting. I mean, it, it all probably seems quite nerdy to most people, but I find it very interesting. So, so, you know, so I suppose my point, <laughs> Giles, is that collaboration takes many different forms. Mm, and, mm. Uh, and I find, I find most of them very, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's no, the best I, thing I, about being a musician is, is to collaborate, you know. I, I agree. I mean, I think, I think that, you know, the, you know, the music industry is the, you know, there've been some fantastic collaborations, you know, some, some not, not so great, you know, but that, that's the, that's the, sometimes the point, isn't it? You know, that, you, you take a risk with some 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 don't work out um mm. but the learning that you can get from that from having i think you know sort of different different perspectives and and the, and the different influences that the you know that your partners bring into it can be can be phenomenal but I, you know to, to to have that in 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 the rest of the world sometimes you know people just don't have that that kind of mindset that sort of open-mindedness to be able to think okay well that's something yes that i could that i could that i could live with and i think there's, there's sometimes a bit of fear that, that sort of creeps in um not necessarily i'm not suggesting in the in the music industry necessarily although i'm sure that is the case but in in other parts of life to collaborate sometimes means giving something up it's like you're giving some knowledge up and i think sometimes there's a bit of fear of, of of doing that and that's what you know i guess trust uh, it as well yeah and i think um but i do think that's a serious issue within the music industry because mm. some projects which are supposed to be collaborations are nothing of the sort you know you will get people going around the world um you know you you'll get a kind of a neo-colonial attitude sometimes where people go around the world stealing a few you know yeah. bars from a from a whatever an oud player in turkey and yeah. they'll kind of and a break beat to it and have a hit with it and the poor oud player in uh yeah. in the east of turkey never sees a penny so you know so again you know there are i think there are real issues here mm. um you know i think it's important that collaboration takes place on an even f mm. foot on on a you know, on 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 a, on a level playing field in terms of the participants, yeah, and uh, and yes, in terms of other parts of of life, um, yeah, I think that the world that we need to collectively strive towards is one where we all meet each other on mm. a level playing. Field. You know, I, I I think that the truth though is that we are still dealing with the fallout of years of imperialism and colonialism mm. and. and mm mindsets that have been forged by that including white supremacist ideas and racist ideas and so you know yeah i, I think that genuine collaboration where you meet as equals with respect yeah, and you listen yeah. carefully to one another to one another yeah is not only where some of the best art comes from but also perhaps where the answers for the whole of humanity mm. found i guess we're like with with this we're sort of going into some of the territory that's covered in in your book which so it's and this wasn't a deliberate segue but it's, it's just natural that we are sort of talking about it but you, you know your book does um sound system um you know the political power of music touches on some of these sort of i guess you know sort of collaboration or non-collaboration appropriation and things like that but the, the what was the, the the genesis of you of the book you know the what was the the, the was was there a particular catalyst that that made you think i need to i need to write about this was this a kind of accumulation of things it wasn't an accumulation of things but 
I mean, it's kind of you to mention the book. I'm pleased you've mentioned it because the truth, Giles, is that, you know, is that I'm very proud of that book. It was yeah. one of the hardest uh, things I've attempted to do. I found it was much harder than making a record, for mm. example. Um, it was a lot of work, even though it's not a particularly long book. It's about 200 pages, but it, mm. it, there was a lot of research that went into that. The catalyst, I suppose, was... Um, my lived experiences, some of the contradictions that I witnessed firsthand yeah. between the kind of the the myth making machine, which is the music industry and particularly pop music and the big events, the MTV awards and, mm. um, you know, all these kind of um, events that I was party to for a while, particularly when I was touring in the early days of Faithless. Yeah. Um uh, but the the contradiction between that and and the reality and um, um, and then you know other events like um, some some and some of which I, I touch on in the book other events like um, you know the question of the, of the Iraq War comes along and some yeah. musicians respond very well to that they they make their voices heard and and um, and and some of them. Um, run into commercial problems as a result and and so you know so real life brought up a lot of these questions mm. and I started to read books that I hoped would kind of give me a framework to think about this stuff more um, uh, you know you know in a more kind of uh, useful way and 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 I felt rightly or wrongly I felt that you know that there was a book missing, you know, that yeah, yes, yeah. good books about particular genres, you know, lots of great books about different periods of jazz music or whatever, Afrobeat or psychedelic rock, you know, and, um, and lots of good books about individual artists, Nina Simone or Fela Kuti or Bob mm. Dylan, um, lots of books about great protest songs, or at least one or two, you know, Dorian mm. Linsky's revolutions a minute i thought was good um so uh so there were lots of good books but i couldn't find one i couldn't find one um that had been written any time recently at least that attempted to kind of weave together a number of different case studies from throughout history and yeah. across cultures and arrive at some conclusions you know mm. to sort of draw out the common threads that can be found between the relationship between the CIA and jazz in the Cold War period. You know, that those stories I was mentioning a moment ago about West Africa and independence and musicians. Yeah. The history of Carnival, which um, which I learned all about when I visited Trinidad a few years ago. Um, and yes, the more obvious, uh, but, but nonetheless important examples like Rock Against Racism and Punk in this country, yeah. Rave, um, and um, and its relationship with the Thatcher government, you know. Yeah. So, what I wanted to do was touch upon all these things in order to sort of to to, to find out what the common themes were, yeah. And therefore, yeah. what we could learn um, how we could how we could best ensure that music serves the interests of the many rather than the few. To rather point. than the few, yeah. Great, yeah. you know, um, and. Um, so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed researching that book. I really enjoyed writing it, although it was difficult. And um, and therefore, thanks for mentioning it. Yeah, I hope if people are even vaguely interested in this stuff, they'll I, try. I, 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 thought, I thought it was fascinating. I mean, it was right up, right up my street. I thought it, it was absolute. I mean, I, you know, for me, you know, sort of music and, um, you know, the messages that... Um, can be uh, sort of transmitted through music, you know, whether that be sort of through politics, or whatever. I think is, I think it's like a kind of an integral part of the, of it. And you know, so I've always been been interested in, as the title says, the political power of music. That that's you know, subject that's really interested me. I thought it was it's excellent. It's really well written. You know, very well researched. And and what was what was one part I remember or one theme that was really interesting for me it was this this, this kind of paradox that that exists in music where it's it's been used music is used as a a powerful tool for protest and for agitators and on the other side it's used as a sort of pacification tool you know sort of by yeah. the 
by the government. I mean, I, 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 when I read that, I was like, oh my God, yeah. I hadn't, yeah. I, 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 it, was, it was just like a, a light bulb went on. I thought, yeah, of course. I picked it, I knew about the protest side, but on the, the other side of it, wow. Well, this is it. I mean, I do feel that um, people pay disproportionate notice to the protest side, you know. Yeah. So, music and politics, people suddenly say Billy Bragg or they say Bob Dylan. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. That's not the whole story, is yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, progressive left-wing music is not the whole story. Think of the national anthem. Think of think of the fact that the Nazis recruited composers directly to the Third Reich. Yeah. Among them, the uh, the great 20th century composer uh, Richard Strauss. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Shostakovich, of course, had a very complicated relationship with with Stalin. So you know, um, so yes, I, I was fascinated in that. Um, well, as you know, because you've mm. been kind enough to, to to have a look at the book. Um, what I learned was that when society divided into classes, which, you know, depending on how you interpret history, happened about 5,000 years ago with the rise mm -hmm. of the great civilizations, but somewhere between five and 10,000 years ago, when society started to divide into a class that looks after the surplus of food and resources and those that work for them, when it divided into classes, music divided with it. You know, mm. you, you had music that was sung in the fields when, when people were att um, attending to the crops and you had music in the courts, you know, the courts of the, of the feudal, uh, you know, in feudal times, the, the courts mm. of the kings uh, and, the, and the pharaohs and the, uh, and the emperors of ancient China and all, uh, 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 and all the rest of it. So, um, um, so yes, music has been used by all sides in all of the great um in all of the great sort of moments of 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 social change mm. um and yeah, i found that fascinating mm. and I still do and really what it underlines for me is the fact that music has a political power because of course you will come across people who deny that who say yeah. um that musicians shouldn't make their political uh, opinions known you know just shut up and entertain us you Next. know <laughs> there's no place for politics in music well that you know i always say to people who come with that kind of idea oh you know um i mean you hear it most mostly about african-american musicians you know i think there's often a kind of an undercurrent of racism to to this mm. shut up and entertain us mm. stuff mm. Um, you know, but if somebody says, oh, actually, I don't think Kanye West should should have should make his political opinions known or whoever. Um, I say I my reply is, would you say the same about Beethoven, who was openly inspired by the revolutionary movements of his time? You know, his yeah. third symphony, Eroica, was all about that. It was originally dedicated to Napoleon Bonaparte. Would you say that to Picasso, yeah, who's yeah. most famous? Painting, arguably, Guernica was um, was was all about the Nazi bombing of that small town in France. You know, and the and, and the answer is no, they wouldn't. You know, they hadn't thought of that. No, it, it's no. actually they wouldn't be so stupid as to suggest that Picasso and Beethoven um, shouldn't yeah. be political. Um, so yeah, I mm. you know I think music and politics have always converged and always will. The question is, how do we? How do we more effectively use music yeah. for progress, you know, to, to achieve yeah. a better world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think... And, you know, uh, my, my favourite subject here, but yeah, that's, that's in large part is what the book is about. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think as well, I think the, the you, you know, you, you don't, in the, in the book, you don't shy away from some um, tough stories, let's say, you know, some, you, yeah. you, you know, and... and um, it, it, it it's for me that's like okay well you are um saying this 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 is this is this is what i'm this is my opinion on it and you know i don't agree with with what what happened so you're you're you know you're you're, you're um you, your desire to to have sort of social justice as the at the top of what you do sort of comes out a lot in the book, let's say. 
um, some people would see that as uh, as risky to 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 say that and 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 i think you know if you're going to write an honest book you write an honest book but some people are, are risk averse and i think especially as we get older we become can become more more sort of risk averse do you find yourself becoming more risk averse as you get older or is it is it do, do you think well sorry i'm just going to say i'm, I'm going to say it like it is yeah it's an interesting question i mean um you're referring in case viewers are kind of scratching their heads wondering what you're talking about i presume that you're referring to the fact that i um describe in the book a sort of a an intellectual journey that i'm taking on which ends with me being persuaded that the cultural boycott of israel should be supported yeah um you know um how um recently radiohead were criticized for going to tel aviv mm. well faces were among the bands um you know alongside massive attack and i mean there have been quite a few bands who have who have taken this other position that i'm about to describe uh, but we yeah we took the the this, this 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 other position which was that palestinian civil society had asked us for one act of solidarity and that is to stay away mm. in the style of boycotts of south africa back in the days of apartheid that that was the non-violent tactic to apply pressure for change that they had chosen democratically and that they simply asked that we you know help them out by subscribing yeah. to it too you know that's the basic argument and and i became persuaded by that having been having played in israel two or three times having visited that part of the world um six or seven or eight times and spoken to many different people um and and i've opened and i've openly argued this not only in the book but yeah. when radio went to tel aviv i had a piece in the guardian and i was on radio four and so on so i've i've openly argued this position and will continue to do so but you're right giles whenever you take politics into the here and now you know it's like everybody now looks back and says oh you know uh, apartheid in south africa was wrong mm. we like nelson mandela nelson mandela is a hero to us now well at the time when you and i were kids mrs thatcher was in number 10 downing street and she was calling him a terrorist yeah, yeah. you know I, I spoke to lots of, of of people at the time who thought oh no you shouldn't have democracy in south africa just look at the rest of africa it will go to ruin and so on and you know so actually in the here and now almost every issue is controversial the iraq war now more or less everybody agrees that the iraq war was a bad idea yeah. among other things it it led to ISIS and all these kind of problems that we've got across the Middle East now. Mm -hmm. Back then, at least 50% of the population backed it. They backed Tony Blair. Mm -hmm. I was on the march against the war on the 15th of February, um, 2003. But lots of people uh, were in favour of the war. So, you know, when politics becomes about live issues, you will, you will upset people. That's yeah. true. But I think, you know, you have to sort of think carefully and continue to have an open mind and an open dialogue with people. Mm -hmm. Be willing to change your mind. Mm. But until you've changed your mind, I think you've got to stick up for your principles. You know, yeah. um, I believe that the way that the Palestinians are being treated is is absolutely dreadful. Mm. Um, and anyone who's looked seriously into that question would arrive at the same conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, you say that out loud, and um, and and you'll upset some people. You and, and uh, that's a shame. You know, it's never my intention to upset mm. people. Yeah, but sometimes it's unavoidable if if yeah. you're going to speak truth. Mm -hmm. But that's my position. Is is I will continue to speak truth on matters of principle, um, but I'll do it in a way. I'll try to do it. I mean, you know, after a couple of pints, I'm not so good at this, but I will try to do it in a way that wins people over. You know, I don't want to hector anyone. I don't want to kind of, um, you know, I don't want to, I certainly don't want to kind of moralise or make people feel bad mm. about uh, their position. I want to win them over. I want to persuade them. Yeah. I want yeah. them to listen to um to the accounts of the people who i've heard from i want you know i want them to 
to uh, to to understand why I yeah. feel the way I do, and um, and to have that conversation with with your um, with your 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 music, your music sort of creation. Does does that um, you know kind of um, those sort of political view political um, the, your polit- political interest? Does that fuel your creativity in terms of sort of songwriting? and sort of music creation? Or is there a multitude of things coming in? Yeah, sometimes, to be honest, sometimes it does. Sometimes it's it's the thing that kind of gives me the energy to get an album finished, you know, mm. because I'm because I'm keen that a particular... The message is heard. Uh, yeah, um, which, again, you know, I, I know that we've been... Um, you know, I think in a way, the kind of the... the there is a kind of a a um a narrative in society whereby that's kind of looked down upon you know this idea that people put serious messages in music is you know I th- I, it would be easy for someone who hasn't heard my music to think it's all a bit po-faced and takes itself a bit too seriously hopefully uh that's not the case um but but yes the the honest answer is yes sometimes it is the politics that is the driving force mm. but not always i mean let's let let me be clear that there are love songs songs yeah. about unrequited on um you know in in the album there are also I, i've made albums i made one i released one under my last name randall yeah uh, an album called stories which is entirely instrumental or or at least it's without lyrics it's actually not true to say it's entirely instrumental but it's an album without lyrics so that so you know i don't only make overtly political music far from it mm-hmm. um don't shy away from it yeah when when um you know when, when when you're writing you know things things go wrong right you know you you think oh, Christ, I rip it up and sort of start again to coin a phrase um what uh what, what, what when that happens what goes through your mind you know how do how do you how do you feel and how do you sort of respond to that well, when I'm writing music, when you're writing music, yeah, and something, and it's it's kind of not, or, or even even let's say even even writing as well, you know, with the you know mm-hmm. going through the book and it's it's just not there, it's not happening, you know. How do you get through that? Well, I think what my process is is kind of there's two important bits to it. One is if if I've got a guitar and I've come up with a little phrase that I like, mm. and generally. I mean when I say I like generally what I mean is that it moves me yeah. you know if I come up with a phrase that takes me emotionally somewhere interesting or mm-hmm. unexpected then I'll record that little phrase I'll you know if necessary just a, a voice memo on my phone yeah but I'll make a note of it. so you know I build up a kind of um, a body of little ideas that interest me and and it's often that that body of little ideas that I'll refer back to when mm. i then want to try finish a song um construct and finish a song so that's important it's important to have that to refer to um but then uh, you know the, the the most accurate analogy i think is with sculpture this idea that there is a good song in there somewhere or there is a good book in there somewhere you've just got to keep chipping away yeah. at it so it's you know it, it's that old uh, cliche which i think is a tr- truism that it's you know that um that it's 90 percent perspiration 10 percent inspiration 90 percent perspiration it's hard work you just yeah. have to keep just hammering keep, away keep going at it yeah you're going at it. and being honest with you i mean you know keep keep checking in with your emotions that's the mm. other thing you know um with both music writing and writing writing you know mm. if mm. you if you've gone off on a kind of um like with writing words if, if you've suddenly gone off on a slightly sort of showing off about how many books you've read or slightly academic when you're not writing an academic book which i never write i mean you know, I'm, not, I'm not an academic but you know if you go off um in the wrong direction um then i think you have to just yeah you have to have the ability to take a step back and think you know would my mate would my mate andy who you know would would he enjoy reading this would he even bother getting to the end of that paragraph no he wouldn't it's gone you know so i think i think you have to use whatever device works for you to kind of take a step back from the work 
and evaluate it on that kind of instinctive emotional mm. level and mm. tweak accordingly yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, for me good production is all about um getting as much emotion out of a performance or a song or a performance and a song as possible yeah um, and a good mix is a good music mix is a mix that kind of flags up the exciting moments as you as you're mm. going through the song you know mm. so you'll back up the guitars where the guitar do the exciting thing in the break and you know so you're yeah. kind of making obvious you're leading people you're kind of making it clear mm. um you're making you're making the experience in one sense i hesitate to use the word because of course it's also good to be challenged but i think usually i at least try to make the experience of listening um to an idea or reading a book um, or, a, or an article to make that as easy as possible for mm. the listener or for the reader you know i don't want people to have to work at it because why should they you know they've got better <laughs> things to do with their lives <laughs> so i try to write in everyday english rather than academic english yeah. you know to be concrete what i mean and with music, I love a hook. I love a poppy hook. I, you know, I won't make everything difficult and um, atonal and mm. um, dissonant just for the sake of it. Just you for know. the sake of it, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll never do that. I'll, um, I'll try and make the music as emotional as possible. Um, you know, obviously with, with, with uh, sometimes with some, some, some success, uh, other times not you know you don't always get it right but that's always the ambition i think i think going going from you know using a lot of gut instinct and emotion i think is is uh counts counts for a lot i mean i i kind of use you know gut instinct a lot i rely on gut instinct a lot i think it's um yeah you, you know yeah. sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but i think it, the, 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 there's something inside that that really holds me when it's when it when it kind of happens you know i, I agree the, I, I totally agree. I was having a conversation with Roland Gift about this, and he was he was talking about how important the guts are, mm. pointing out that that the way we the way we even talk about our guts in language, the, the, you know, the expression "I hate your guts" mm. um, is mm. one. This idea that the True. most important yes. and intimate part of you is your guts. <laughs> you know, That's not very I hate true. Your brain, or I hate your brain, or I hate your heart. I hate your guts. You know? And um, <laughs> I think that I think that is an interesting point that he was that he was making. Um, that is, and, actually, and to, give, yeah. to give you a slightly more highbrow, not 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 more highbrow than Rolling Gift, for goodness' sake. I mean, you know, I love Rolling Gift. That that, that didn't come out quite, quite right. But to give you a more literary reference, um, this idea of gut instinct reminds me of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. You know, the the book by Robert M. Persig because he talks about a kind of an instinct, what he calls in his very philosophical language, he calls it a pre-intellectual sense of what's good, good with a, no, of, of what's quality, quality mm. with a capital Q. That's one of his central kind of themes in that book. But this idea that um, we feel what's right, mm. you know, mm. um, and, and I think that's true. I that's think that's true. very closely related to gut instinct. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and that's true. I mean, he, he makes the argument in the book that it's, it's true not only of romantic things like writing music and, and making art, but it's also true of, um, of other things like fixing motorbikes, like engineering and mathematics and mm -hmm. so on. That, you know, he thinks that the... the, the dichotomy between the romantic and the classical i think are the terms he uses he thinks that's a falsehood and actually there's a kind of a unity i mm. suppose the bit where he's influenced by eastern ideas there's a unity to human activity that um um that we don't see very often in the west you know that we're unaware of but he argues that there's a unity to it mm. and one of the unifying factors is what you and i would would call the value of gut instinct. Oh, your gut instinct, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is interesting, isn't it? You know. Dave, that's brilliant. I think that's a that's a really positive way to way to end, I think, on 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 sort of gut instinct as we would say. Yeah, okay. 
It's Brilliant. been a pleasure. So yeah. thanks, thanks very much, Dave. I really appreciate it. It's been a fascinating chat. I could uh, I, I could listen to you talk all day. So um, thanks so much for coming on. It's been been great. Great to see you again as well. Very kind of you. It's been a pleasure for me too. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Take care, Dave. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the show. And I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll tune in for the next episode. In the meantime, it would be really awesome if you could rate and review the show and also share it with any friends who you think might enjoy it.